Please welcome Sir Tony Blair and Lord Haig. Welcome, welcome. It's brilliant to have you both here today to hear your thoughts on early childhood. All of the skills that we've discussed today are clearly so important to everybody, and that also includes prime ministers and leaders of the opposition. So I'd like to start... Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> we all know, Lord Hay. Um I'd love to know which of the skills that we've talked about have been most valuable to you in your personal life, but also within government as well. Well, empathy is very important, I've got to know. And uh, of course, we all think of empathy as identifying with people, feeling sorry for people. That's very, very important to be able to do that. But you actually need empathy between rival <laughs> leaders. Because, you know, here we are, it's Wednesday morning. 20 years ago, we would have been preparing for Prime Minister's question time. And I would have been empathizing with the Prime Minister. <laughs> no, not in sense of feeling sorry for him, but I had to work out his point of view mm. and what he was expecting that day so that I would then do something completely different. <laughs> but the, but that, that is a form of empathy. That is, um, you have to be able to place yourself in somebody else's shoes, um, even, in a, even when you're engaged in ruthless competition. You know, it, it's a survival skill. It's not just empathy. It isn't just uh, feeling somebody's pain. I wanted to cause him pain. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's very important. And I would say um, social and emotional um, skill. When you are trying to get a member of parliament to walk through a voting lobby, and tonight, uh, you know, the Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer will be trying to do that. Social and emotional skills are more important than the actual argument a lot of the time, to get that reluctant member of part, the party leader has to deploy full, intense social and emotional skills to get the MP through the, through the voting lobby. I like that we started honestly. Thank you, Farley. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, and I, I have to say, I can't really remember thinking you were being very empathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Although you did cause me a lot of pain. You were very I, internal. I always say one of the great life lessons is humiliation. Uh, you know, you, you learn much more when you, when you, you're, especially if you end up public humiliation, and William did that to me on a number of uh, occasions, the most memorable of which is we, we decided that we would publish um, a list of the government's achievements. So anyway, they prepare this great document with a list of achievements, and I decided to give a statement in the House of Commons, you know, boasting about everything the government had done. And he stands up and he says, I notice on page 35, it says you've built a new sports centre in Sheffield. Where is it? <laughs> I went back afterwards because, unfortunately, no one could tell me where it is. And the civil service said to me, yeah, I know. He said it's not actually been built yet. It's more a it's more a concept. Does it? Thank you very, thank you very much. So the, the boy from Sheffield knew about it. Yeah. yeah. Was, so, that, was that empathy? Well, <laughs> look, it, it's. I think. I mean, first of all, by the way, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really think this 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 subject about how you shape the early years. I mean, it's phenomenally important today for all sorts of reasons. Um, that have been traditionally so, but I think some reasons that are to do with the modern world and how it operates and how young people are going to, if they're going to navigate that world, uh, need need to have the skills to do it. And yeah, I mean, William's right. The the um, the the ability to to understand where the other person's coming from, I mean, it's just a vital skill in life because if you, I mean, if you if you're not able to do that, I mean, then you know some of the the tech geniuses are not good at doing that. But as, as I say, if you're a tech genius, that's fine. You'll do fine anyway. But for the rest of us, if you can't get on with people, if you can't understand where they're coming from, it's very difficult to get anything done. What about specifically with leadership? Which skills do you think that you've both cultivated over the years have, have helped with leadership? Well, when you, you go through that, uh, you, you I think in the paper that um, the foundation's done with your cluster of six Six different skills, I think, and were there uh, self, uh, emotions, thoughts, communication, relationship, and imagination. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> um, You've been preparing. I have. I have. Well, I, I, I also learned that with Prime Minister's questions. Um, so, um, I think 
you know, all of those are, are emotional skills that are, are, are really important. But I think I would add another two that maybe are subsets of, of, of those, that categorization. First of all, your, your ability to take responsibility. You know, in, in the end, for any of you who are leading organizations, you know, the hardest thing about leadership is you have to take responsibility. You know, you lift the mantle of responsibility onto your own shoulders. And that is part of the resilience uh, out of the equation. And resilience is important. I think sometimes we under, underestimate it. You know, young people need to be resilient. And linked to that is, is to, to try and have the right temperament when you're dealing with life's difficulties. And one of the things that, that is really important, I think, and this, this applies whether you're in politics or in any other walk of life, is, you know, you, you, especially if you're taking on a, a leadership role, then you've got to have the right temperament to be able to handle criticism, to be able to, you know, have people say things about you that, you know, you don't like being said, but nonetheless, um, you, you've got to just put up with it. And to be able to keep that equilibrium mentally as you're going through life, I think is a really, really important skill. This is really important. This is, this is a point I was going to make. Emotional resilience, um, which is not something you can learn suddenly as an adult. You know, that is something that is developed in early childhood. And that, uh, as, a, as a political leader, you really need that because you have days where, you know, a poll shows 98% of people think you're doing a terrible job or something like that. Um, and, um, and you go and give a speech and somebody actually throws something at you. Um, and, you know, and you can feel terrible. You feel everybody disagrees with me. And, so, but, and when you get home, you still have to have a, some self-worth. You know, otherwise, you would become so depressed you wouldn't be able to do the job. And um, that emotional resilience is rooted in um, in childhood. So I think that is a, in early childhood that is an absolutely essential skill of leadership. So looking back to childhood, who or what do you think helped you to cultivate the skills needed for what you've both gone on to do? In my case, my parents. <laughs> They're pretty important uh, in in. Uh, helping you develop those skills. Um, and then I, I was lucky to have a succession of people who were uh, teachers or the person I did my apprenticeship with when I was a, a, a lawyer starting out, who, uh, you know, were people who were prepared to take the time to really teach me things. But also you, you learn about, um, you learn about it often through your friendships, through the relationships you, you create and people that you can trust and talk to and you can have a, a frank conversation with um, and who are prepared to be frank with you as well. I mean, the, and, and it's a, it's a uh, I was describing to someone the other day because there was a time in my life when I really did want to be a rock star, right? I actually did want to, I was, I was in a band with very long hair and you know, I, I was the singer in the band and occasionally played the guitar. And I had a very meaningful conversation uh, on, on one of the few occasions where the lead guitarist was sober. Uh, he, he said to me, look, he said, I really like you, but frankly, you're useless. <laughs> he said, you can't sing and you're not very good at the guitar. So he said, you're going to have to find something else. But anyway, we, we had a frank conversation about what I was good at. And he said, well, you know, you're not bad at getting on with people. He said, just think about something that's, that's involving that. I thought, yeah, that's maybe. Uh, so I think... You know, the other thing um, to emphasize is that I think these skills are more important today because, you see, w w when I was growing up and, and you got educated, you learned by rote, you know, and you pass exams, right? So you could pass exams, okay? And provided you did enough work and you had a reasonable degree of intelligence, you could pass the exams. But today, you, 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 and the teacher was the, the person who gave you the information. But today, the teacher's not the person that gives you the information. The information's at the child's fingertips, right? What you need to be is you need to be creative. You need to be able to think and think about propositions, challenge propositions. You need to be open-minded to other people. You know, the world is a world that, where prejudice is not just wrong today. It's, it's a drawback, right? It stops you... It stops you interacting with people. It stops you succeeding in life. So these are skills that you often learn through relationships, through through you know mixing with people and and your peers and having the sort of frank conversation 
that if you don't have, you know, you're you're going to be a you're reduced as a person. So I I think this is why I think this this what what you're debating today is so important, and it, and it's a world away from um, the situation that I grew up in. Yeah, it's all extremely important. Um, I don't want to. To, uh, sort of distract too much from what you just said, but I'm really intrigued as to what your band was called. Well, it's it's a, the, the, there are two. The, the band's name is was was Ugly Rumors, which was after uh, which Ugly quite Rumors. appropriate. I know, quite appropriate. Uh, yes, I like it. Well, it was after a Grateful Dead song, apparently. But um, but the thing I'm really, really, really pleased about is there was no social media in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I promise you, I wouldn't We're be gutted. sitting here, William. <laughs> It would have been great if you'd become a rock star. Oh, uh, I you would. <laughs> uh, I would have had such an easy career. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not hey, yes. is, is my yeah. mother, really, is the yeah. answer to your uh, question, you know, who was always supportive without being too protective. And uh, my, uh, uh, in complete contrast to Tony, I actually did want to be a politician, uh, very worryingly. Uh, when I was, uh, <laughs> I was a child, and um, and, I, and, I, and I was too successful at that because uh, you know I ended up being very famous when I was sixteen. Yeah. Uh, due to giving a speech, and um, it was my mother who then said, "I mean, this is not early childhood, but it's still you know I was a teenager." Uh, who said, "Okay, so now you you think you're this famous, and uh, you're being offered everything, columns and newspapers and TV shows, which I was at sixteen years old." She said, Nari, okay, I'm intervening now. You're not doing any of that. You are going back to your A-levels, and you can do all that in later life. And, uh, you know, she sorted me out. So um, didn't let me get too far too fast. So my mother was always the main formative influence Brilliant. in my life. So Tony Blair, when you were in government, early childhood was of paramount importance to you. What was the thinking behind that? What was driving that? Um, it really based on evidence uh, that early childhood was really important and that you were liable to do much better at school if you got the help uh, in, in early childhood, that a lot of parents um, who weren't often in conventional nuclear families were, were, uh, were needing that help. And I think the interesting thing is that, and I know you've, you've heard from people today about this, the evidence today is much stronger than it was back then. So there's an even stronger case for acting on this today than, than than there was then. But it was a big part of what we what we did, and and you know for, for I mean I know this both from my own children and now from 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 grandchildren that that early education, however they they get it, I mean it's so critical to their development, and if they don't get it, they're always playing catch up, right? So it's it's I think you know now. Now that we know that the evidence is there, um, the rest of it's just, as it were, political will and policy. And I think that's where you know, people, the, the, the people who are, who are here today can help, because I think you need, to get, you need to get policy in this area that's really imaginative. And I don't think there should be any great political divide about the importance of, of early years. I think wh wherever you sit in the political spectrum, you should accept it, and people do. Uh, the question is, what's the best way of, of, of getting the right, um, you know, the right policy in place that, that this can be a, a reality? And by the way, those countries that have focused a lot on early education, um, particularly in some of the Nordic countries, I mean, you can see the results there in, in later educational attainment. Yeah, absolutely. Lord Haig, the princess has talked about early childhood being a golden opportunity to really see the future generations thrive. Have you got any of your own reflections that you'd like to add to that? Well, yes, I, I agree with, uh, it's funny, isn't it, all these years later we agree. <laughs> uh, all these, I very much agree with what uh, Tony has just been saying. And I think the, um, from the point of view of governments and politicians, the, the evidence is mounting, you know, and we've seen some of that earlier today. The science is there now. But this has not been an obvious thing for in past years to... Um, uh, to people in government, quite a lot was done in, in Tony's government. Uh, the current government has, you know, families, families first for children programs, and so on. The ministers like Andrew Leadsom, who's here, are very well informed uh, <clears throat> about this. But it's not; it's never been as clear a case as it is, say, in preventative healthcare. You know, where 
it's easy for ministers to say, well, okay, right, if we spend on cancer prevention and screening, uh, well, then, you know, within a few years, we're saving a lot of money on, on treating all those people with cancer. The, the payback is quite quick, uh, uh, and it's a really obvious connection. But in early childhood, we have to demonstrate, well, yes, actually, if you give the necessary attention to that, there are tens of billions of pounds that you save later, Dana, but it's through all the different stages of life and in multiple services, and there's never really been a number in government that is what you say. It's not as easily quantified as you don't have to treat those cancer patients in, uh, uh, in three or five years' time. So I think it's going to be very important in the political sphere because all the political parties uh, are indeed now more and more interested in this and developing policies to do it. It's, it's going to be really important to establish that science and that argument. And um, once that is established, well, then really the, you know, the momentum will will be there. I think Professor Warding has got the stats, if you want them. So we no, I, I think it, no, I... Pass them I, over. Uh, Eight uh, years uh, worth, I believe. They are, they are very convinced, but they haven't yet percolated the consciousness of um, everybody who needs to understand them. Yeah, so we need to keep That's talking we're here for. stuff. Exactly. How do you think we can best rally people collectively around this topic to really ensure there is positive change in the future? I mean, I think the best thing is, is just to, to provide the evidence um, and to try and... I think that there's, there's several things in politics today wh where you should be able to have a consensus and where you need one to, to get things rooted in the long term. I mean, the biggest problem that you... You have with, I mean, I'm a great supporter of democracy, obviously, but the the problem, <laughs> yeah, the pro, the problem the problem, however, with a system in which every few years you've got an electoral cycle, is if you're not careful, it's difficult to to put policy in place and have it work for the long term, and yet this this is an area where without a long term plan in place with the right structure and framework, you're not really going to make a difference. And as William says, by the way, if you put in the best early years program in the world today, it's probably 15, 20 years maybe later that you can demonstrate its, its worth. So how you, how, and, and exactly the same is true, by the way, for um, prevention in, in healthcare. There's going to be a whole set of new things that you can do with technology today, but you'll need to change the system now. Now, it's not, the problem is that the short-term electoral cycle means that if you've got a certain sum of money to spend and someone says, well, if you spend this money, um, <laughs> in 20 years' time, someone's going to stand up and say, this is a huge success. You're going to think, yeah, mm, okay, but not me, right? <laughs> so, and the thing is, if you can get it as established as a, as a consensus so that people do it and it's put, you know, you develop roots for the long term then you know you you're you're going to get round that problem that people have even if they want to do the right thing for the long term they think well yeah but you know in 5 10 years time it's it could be a different government with a different set of priorities so to make it a national priority i think is really really important and you know that is the that's the way and that's the way that you will get this accepted and then not it, it may be adjusted, it probably will be, or policies should be. It may be reformed, but it won't be abandoned. And to make that a national priority and have a project that is of lasting significance, mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, you know, that's got to be the am ambition here. And it really, it's like a lot of things today, which is, you know, I've come to the conclusion after a long time in politics that politics just gets in the way a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, it's it's because really it's not a it, it it's got nothing to do with where you are on the ideological spectrum. It's to do literally with okay. I mean, everyone accepts it's a cliche because it's true. The children of the future, right? And you want to develop them as well as you can. Right? Everyone agrees with that. So if this early years is a vital part of doing that, you need to be able to do it in a way that lasts and would last through a whole generation because it's then you, you'll really see the benefit. So if we look to the future. And, you know, we, we're leaving a pandemic behind us where we've got rise in AI and that sort of, I guess, uh, more use of digital 
devices, that sort of disconnect for people, conflict globally. There are many challenges that young people face today looking to the future. How can we support young people, not just to deal with all of these changes going on, but to, to thrive? Well, I think there's the, there's the things that governments can do uh, that is largely what we've been talking about. But there are multiple levels in society um, with families, businesses, civic society, uh, all of whom represented here in one way or another today. And so yet it, this will require important changes and developments in government policy of any, of any political party. Uh, but it also, we have to work, and this is this is part again of, of this um, of why we're here, at removing the stigma in uh, families from learning, from thinking that it's okay to learn from somebody else about early childhood, um, and um, for businesses to uh, there's a business task force associated with this centre um, to also be working together, and not just what they're doing in their business, but changing these attitudes and priorities uh, and civic society joining in because you know if you take us back to it we've still got the brains and emotions of hunter gathering people uh, of a few thousand years ago but in in those communities the whole community would have been involved uh, the whole community and the wider family were the, at the natural if you like in inverted commas of of, of managing early childhood um, a much wider spread of people involved than the quite fragmented society that we live in today. So, um, so trying to make it less fragmented is a very important part of supporting those people for the future. Because the, the point you've made and that Tony was making earlier that, uh, you know, we, we are li we're about to live in a period of unprecedented change of the, of the fastest changes in technology in the whole history of human civilization. That's going to be a very disorientating um, and sometimes divisive experience. So these qualities of emotional resilience and empathy and communication are going to be more important than ever. Without a doubt, without a doubt. It's been really fascinating listening to your points today and um, I'm sure we've all got a lot to take away from this discussion. Thank you so much, Lord Haig and Sir Tony Blair. Thank you. Thank you so much.